<laughs> Most welcome to Green Malaysia Park. Uh, my name is Hendrik Sudia, and I work here at as a business developer. Uh, Green Innovation, I'm just going to introduce where you're at uh, for a minute, that's it, and then I'll leave uh, the floor to our guests for today. So Green Innovation Park is a physical place for the activities and the programs that SLU Holding is working with. SLU Holding is a SLU dedicated business development unit office company, if you will. We help researchers identify impact potential from research within their research <clears throat> for use in society and different parts of society and vice versa to scout society and different areas, public sector, private, et cetera, for challenges, uh, desires, dreams, uh, and project them into the uh, research or the researcher community for hopefully uh, a good match and hopefully uh, mutual benefits. So that's the idea. So this is sort of a, a meeting place for good creative meetings. And I'll stop there because now we have two good, interesting examples of impact. Let's call it that. Roz and Elizabeth are here, and I uh, wish you uh, very much welcome. And uh, just to uh, clarify, do you want questions throughout the presentation or afterwards? Throughout the presentation yeah. is throughout. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Uh, the only caveat is uh, there are someone in Zoom, and it's recorded because uh, we have collaborators in India that will be watching it later. And for them, for them, SLU is a Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Correct. Most so, welcome. So we might repeat questions if yes. you ask questions so that we're sure that yes. it goes into the recording. Very good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yes. We have not rehearsed this, so it's just like jazz, okay? So yeah, the title is Climate Positive Swedish Beef and Dairy. Um, and, you know, I'm a mathematician, so formally what we're doing is regenerative and resilient life systems as a decentralized self-replicating economic service. So that might hopefully make a bit sense after the presentation today, what we mean with that. So let's start off with a couple of quotes um, because we wanted to do this presentation as a bit of our personal journey where we ended up where we are and also talking about the science of where we ended up where we are and what we want to do. So Greta Thunberg uh, in one of her speeches in the World Economic Forum said, adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope, but I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if the house is on fire because it is. And this is uh, a quote uh, from Antonio Guterres, uh, the UN Secretary General. And uh, he says the era of global warming has ended, the era of global boiling has arrived, leaders must lead, no more hesitancy, no more excuses, no more waiting for others to move first, there is simply no more time for that. It is still possible to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius and avoid the very worst of climate change, but only with dramatic immediate climate action. So what is the problem? Um, so here is a, a bit of an, a schematic overview that shows that there are a lot of feedback loops because climate change is part of a very complicated system. It's not only one process. So there are feedback loops between land degradation, climate change and biodiversity loss. So without going into all of the details here, we see how these different processes can drive each other. Poor land and water management leads to biodiversity loss leads to loss of flora and fauna above and below ground, further land degradation, which might lead to even worse 
decisions regarding uh, land management, etc. Yeah, and of course you have increase of say greenhouse gases, which in turn affects climate change. That in turn increases the extreme events like droughts and floods all over the world, different anticipated rates. And uh, so it's a, it's a wicked problem. So I don't know, um, we don't know the audience uh, where you guys and girls are. So we thought maybe we'll play this video um, just to sort of sync things up a bit. And set the scene. <clears throat> So this video had a focus on soil, and that is coming into focus now in policy in the UN. So for nutrition, state of the art within so, the EU, like we generate that, uh, agriculture in Europe, band that nobody told you was going to be there before. On soils. So they do a critical analysis of contribution to European Union farm to fork and biodiversity strategies. And in Sweden. Food as industry, food tech or culture, or even food forgotten, a report on scenario skeletons of Swedish food futures, uh, a MISTRA project by mainly done by people here at SLU. Okay. So I guess the point is that there is quite a lot of synergetic convergence of principles to underlying solutions. And of course, there is a lot of nuances and almost different schools of thought on how to solve it exactly. Uh, one other point I want to bring up is that we have risks from rising temperatures. So there's various uh, mathematical modeling projections of how climate change is going to affect different biomes. And that's something one has to also be cognizant of when planning. Um, so of course, solutions take time. And this is something extremely important. And this is part of the reason I basically have stepped outside academia, I leave now, I don't know. Uh, just for a year now, maybe indefinite. So, uh, you know, this is 
from 2007 when there was no wetland. This is uh, one of our inspiring. Um, it's an example from South Africa. But, yeah. uh, 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 a group working uh, uh, on raising strategies to restore uh, mismanaged land. So the, they managed to convert a uh, dry overgrazed area through cattle grazing just in a different way that it than it had been done traditionally uh, into a wetland basically in this time frame. But it did, did take, yeah. shows it does take time. It does take time. Now we have like migratory birds uh, stopping by there and making babies and and elephants like coming back for watering holes and so on, right? So this is Alan Savory. Um, so again, one of the main points here is this is sort of, sort of obvious. It's come from so many different cultures, the general principle of you are what you eat. So what, which has been around in Western culture and in Eastern culture. So uh, in French in the 1800s, dis-moi ce que tu manges, je te dirai ce que tu es. Tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. Around the same time in Germany, their mensch ist, was er ist. Man is what he eats. And uh, in India, much earlier, second century BC. Bakshete. Okay, I'll just so lamp eats darkness and produces black soot. What food quality one eats daily, so will one produce. This is Chana Kiniti, second century BCE. And then there is the original Hippocrit Hippocratian oath which uh, properly translated is, I will apply dietetic and lifestyle measures to help the sick to my best ability and judgment. I will protect them from the harms, fifth century BC. And of course, this is fairly complex. Now we have very, very recent research, 2023 and so on, where we, you know, the gut microbiome uh, of fruits and vegetables sort of possibly influences diversity in the gut. So the microbiome of the rhizosphere, the roots of the plants we are eating actually has direct uh, sort of uh, influences on our gut microbiome, which is necessary for absorbing what we are eating, right? So in that sense, we, in a very real sense, we really are what we eat. So that is now substantiated by modern research. So part of what we eat mm -hmm. actually gets incorporated into our own microbiome. And this is ongoing research by some rather innovative uh, labs, just six of them in the world, I think. So this is now, if you introduce meat into the picture, you have a, a very interesting uh, spectrum of phytochemical richness um, that actually sort of increases uh, in the spectrum as we go toward more plant species, diverse pastures and forests where these plant species, of course, come with the microbial ecology of their rhizospheres and, and so on. And there is a big difference between that on one end and feedlot finished on concentrates, sort of completely grain fed, automated sort of robots in the process, uh, food on the other end. So going back to the quotes, <laughs> a recurring theme, uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. So if we're now putting all of this, what we've showed you so far together, our theorem uh, becomes this. So first, suppose that the following three statements are true. We have to eat to live. You are what you eat, be the change you want to see. So the following then holds, eat the change you want to be. So that is what we decided to do. <laughs> I mean, it seems really silly, but I guess, I mean, I'm a mathematician, so I, I really think these three are axioms that I believe, or we believe, to be self-evident. And then if you follow those, uh, if you're, yeah, and then what follows logically is you should eat the change you want to be, right? Because you are an entity in space-time, eating other entities in space-time, right? So how do we apply the theorem in our real life? Well, you know, we sold our house and bought a farm, basically. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit about me. I'm, uh, I'm Raz, uh, Raz Ash I'm, um, I don't know, I'm a maths uh, associate professor uh, with specialization in data science at Uppsala University. I also have another hat, uh, I'm director of technical strategy. Now I'm an advisor of mathematical data engineering sciences at uh, two companies, uh, which serve a large network of uh, companies in Scandinavia. 
Uh, I don't know, I'm old, I'm almost 50 soon. I have a bunch of papers. I've been in US, UK. I'm an Indian American, New Zealander. Uh, and yeah. a Swedish citizen now. Okay, yes, I'm a Swedish citizen now. It's good. I can make less money legally. It's great. So anyway, 25 years of experience in solving real world problems using custom built models and uh, yeah. So PhD at Cornell and whatever, Oxford will stop. Uh, yes, and I am a biologist by training. I did my PhD in behavioral ecology at the Max Planck Institute of Cornisology in Cities and in Germany back in ooh, 2009. And now I'm a docent and researcher at uh, here at SLU. I'm in the Department of um, uh, uh, Aquatic Resources, SLU Aqua. So I work a lot in fishery science and advising government agencies on sustainable resource use um and i've done a whole lot of teaching in my career also in statistics and biology so we created a set of goals and a new mission for the rest of our lives so our goals are to produce some of our own food to eat locally produced food from small-scale farmers we get to know to do research jointly with local farmers and to help others to be able to eat more directly. And so we want to shorten the value chains. So how do we transform to uh, be able to, to uh, start this new mission? Well, we already had a small family business that was mainly doing AI and digital consulting. So we simply broadened the mission of the family business to mediate farm to mouth transparently and to do co uh, production centered systems, reaches and development within agricultural systems. And of course, the production centered systems research and development is very different in my sort of opinion uh, from that research, which is possible purely in academic setting, right? Because it's very difficult to, 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 to do this. That means you want to put your life on the line to produce the food you have to make to survive and, and have that as the center of your R&D, right? This is what farmers are doing. So that's sort of the main difference. Uh, and in the first part of this uh, mission, who do we want to sell to? Well, we want to target enthusiastic people who are studying and are researching to change the world. Uh, and who might agree with our um, theorem of eating the change they want to be. So that's why we're here today. Miss Saga here? Yes. Oh yeah, hey Saga. So I should thank you. So you actually inspired me during your Q&A with the alumni of the event, uh, alumni, alumni of the SLU event, where even you were saying that students are kind of on a budget and you know. They want to eat good food, but it's difficult with the pricing situation. So that kind of inspired us actually to see that this could be our, our target group. Yes, onwards. Do we really have to go, nice. go through our full mission statement? We have a very philosophically I mean, the, the main thing mission. is that we are thinking about it as algorithms, machines, lives, and planet framework. That's the system theoretic framework. And that sort of basically encapsulates everything we're doing. Yes. So we went ahead and tried to build up a core team to help us in our mission. So you will hear a bit more later about the farmers that we have established collaborations with. So we are collaborating with Sven Alf Blum, who is a beef farmer. He's our chief farming scientist. And then we have Gudrun Johansson and her daughter, Eva Johansson Fadell. So they are a two generation uh, dairy cattle farm that do traditional forest grazing since several generations back. And then we have uh, Professor Gidre Kien uh, over in Lithuania, who is our advisor on ancient farming systems, mainly in a European context. And then we have uh, Balasubramanian Govesimandri. Balasubramanian Govindasami. Thank you. So he's our chief farming scientist in the other field station we have. I mean, for mathematical generalizability, we need exactly at least two examples, rather. So the other one is in South India. It's, uh, it's along the coast of a big river system called Kaveri. And uh, that's, uh, he won't talk about it, but it has five 
canopy levels. It's it's, it's tropical. It's a very different uh, ecology and system. Agroforestry built on ancient Tamil principles. So, yeah. yeah. And as you hinted, we bought a farm. So this is our home base and also is uh, uh, turning into a field station to do these types of living systems uh, field research in collaboration with neighboring farmers. Uh, and it's set, situated exactly at the geographic midpoint of Sweden. For those of you who are curious, that's between Sundsvall and Ånge along Ljungan. Um, so we have a, with modern standards, very small farm there of 18 hectares, half field, half forest land. Um, yes. And, a river and a lake. Yeah, so it has a riverfront and a lake so that we can study interactions between land and water. And it has hunting rights so that we can also um, use, uh, yeah, we can combine this with monitoring wildlife um, and hopefully collaborate with the local hunters. Yeah, I mean, every farm operation is unique. So we also have a stream that flows all year round uh, that meanders through the property before it goes into Yungnan. Um, yeah, so you have to think about the climate, land shape, water supply, soil type, local flora and fauna, customer base, labor, capital. Yeah, um, we're focusing on beef for now, but we are aware of uh, designing carefully and our current experiments we will talk about soon. Uh, taken a whole systems view into consideration. Yes. So, talking about beef. Yeah, talking about beef and talking about complexity and talking about what we said, uh, what you mentioned in the beginning, that there are often very strong views and very strong positions taken. So there is an absolutely excellent podcast that was hosted by Table, and the podcast itself is collaboration between SLU, Oxford, and Wageningen universities where they really take a deep dive uh, into the future of meat. And they set it up as four scenarios that sounds like different alternative futures, efficient meat, alternative meat, less meat, uh, or plant-based no meat. But they really, really do a very good job of interviewing people who have really strong views for what each and every one of these four scenarios. And they obviously come away with the message that it's complex and the future probably will be a combination of these four rather than exclusively one of the others and they all have benefits they all have drawbacks uh, and we would say that if we fall in more in one of these camps than the others we would fall more into the eat less farm better uh, camp and we will uh, explain to you a bit more why so you wanted to say something about this? Yeah, so, I mean, what we're doing here is, I don't know, I, I, in maths, I tell I, I do a lot of open source coding. So this is open research. So it's all live video blogging. Anyone can contribute anytime. Um, so this is uh, on the QR code. This is our uh, Living Systems uh, Breakworks uh, YouTube channel. It has several playlists. And I think the two main ones are the ones that start with natural experiments with forest grace, Grazing Dairy, third, and the natural experiments with Stanov, Johnny Bloom. Um, so those are the two past forest and pasture raised dairy experiments we're doing jointly with, uh, with our farming scientists. So that's where you deep dive for all kinds of detailed instructions or experiments we're doing. It's an incredible amount of detail on the pilots we've done so far, yeah. this first very first season on the farm. Yes, so let's talk a little bit more about, we were mentioning beef, we we're mentioning uh, eat less but better. So what does better mean? That's also a question. So what could this mean uh, more concretely? So it might mean rearing the beef on semi-natural grasslands. So this is a nature type that's been around in Sweden since agriculturalists first arrived around 6,000 years ago. Essentially it's a niche construction by humans. If you leave a semi-natural grazed land alone, it's going to turn into forest. It is dependent on management by humans, but it has to be a limited management. If you go in and do too much, you will usually decrease the biodiversity and end up with more of a monoculture. It contains the highest small-scale plant species richness on Earth, 
uh, and has high insect and fungal diversity. And one third of red listed species in Sweden occur or are dependent on uh, semi natural grasslands uh, to survive. So, this is a very important uh, habitat or nature type in Sweden. And traditionally, it was managed in a way such that you had in Swedish, you had in Marken, this is the productive land around your settlement where you do your more intense agriculture. Then you have Utmarken, the outlands. This is the less productive land where farm animals generally grazed. For a long part in history, they were grazing completely freely. Then there were constraints with fencing and so on. But this system more or less lived on rather intact until the end of the Second World War, where it's changed very drastically how we manage our lands. Um, and Utmarken here means these semi-natural grasslands and also forest lands that were grazed by not just cattle, but also sheep and goats and horses, of course. Um, so in 1850, we had more than 12 million hectares of semi-natural grasslands. Today, we're down to 0.4 million hectares, and it's still decreasing. And if we want to follow EU use habitat and species directive, you might have heard of the 30 by 30. We should protect 30% of our habitats by 2030. Uh, we would need to restore and manage 2.2 million hectares in addition to the 0.4 million hectares we use today. And this could be either through grazing or it could be through taking hay or, or lay every year. And what about forest grazing? I mentioned this a bit, and this is traditionally done, at least in middle and northern Sweden, it's done in the Fabud system. This is essentially mountain holdings where you transfer the animals in the summer. Somebody lives up there with them and they graze freely in the forest. In the mid 1800s, when we had the peak number of Fabud in Sweden and Norway, they were more than 100,000 active ones. Now we're down to around 200 in Sweden and 900 in Norway. So an extremely drastic decrease. Um, and they've been quite ignored in research until recently where there's become a lot of research interest coming now in, into this uh, because uh, raising um, animals in this way uses local food resources that would otherwise not be used. So it can potentially be climate friendly. Uh, they've seen now in recent studies that milk from mountain holdings has a more complex melon taste, more omega-3 fatty acids, more antioxidants mm. compared to regular milk or even the same cows in winter. I, I code faster, like 20% faster. Yeah, you've tried this summer. milk and you, yeah, it <laughs> increases your coding performance. Yes. Um, and the one reason that these uh, um, managing methods were abandoned was because they are less productive than current methods. And the focus has been on increasing yield, increasing production. But these systems may be more resistant to flooding, to drought, to insect pests. They have a higher albedo, meaning it's a lighter uh, color. So it reflects sunlight more. So there's preliminary uh, research hinting at this. And we have to see how general that is. Um, they have higher biodiversity. They have potentially increased carbon storage and climate resilience compared to other management methods. But a lot more research is needed. So it's starting to receive a lot of interest, but we need a lot more research to know these things for sure. Yep. And as I was mentioning in animal production, uh, very strongly since around the end of the Second World War, where this uh, traditional management methods were abandoned, the focus has been on increased yield. And this leads to a focus on animals and agricultural fields, not in the less productive forest because yields are lower. Increase yield by weight. Yeah, by weight, by, ac by amount produced, not, not yield as components. in the nutritional value or other aspects that you could have in the, in the concept of yield. So there's been very little research on forest grazing lands and agricultural research in Sweden until recently. Uh, at least from the perspective of animal production on these lands. There's been research more on the biodiversity aspects and other aspects, but from the aspect of actually having this as an active farming system for producing uh, products from animals, there's been very little research. Um, 
and how forest grazing is classified and defined, because this I have intentionally not defined it here, because it is a little bit of a hazy term. It's a bit of a hazy definition. Um, so how this is uh, interpreted by individual people at the county board could affect if an individual farmer gets part of a government incentive program or not, right? So how these how things are defined determines government incentive structures and that determines what farmers are gonna do because they will not do things that are discouraged. They will do things that are incentivized. And you wanted to say a bit more yeah, about this so recent history. One could go quite deep into these rabbit holes. So why all of this happened? Uh, well, World War II is sort of a punctual punctuation here. Um, it's the same problem all around the world. You had massive amounts of uh, factories that were manufacturing tanks and planes in you know, Germany and the US and so on. And you also had a lot of chemical uh, plants that were making various things to kill humans. And uh, you also had massive ammunition facilities, right? And you can see how all of that got simply retooled with minimal industrial engineering to sell fertilizer, pesticides, and biocides, and the tractors, right? So this is not something I'm saying, it's very well known. So there is actually very interesting logistics of the way Bretton Woods was architected after World War II, that we suddenly had this strange system where everything is yield optimizing, right? So, so but then that happened uh, externally, but in, within Sweden, what was happening is urbanization because Swedes basically became a knowledge intensive industry and uh, uh, resource intensive. So there's a lot of forestry and mining and, and there's more money to be made in these small towns that were springing up in bigger, bigger cities. So urbanization started happening uh, for, and then there was also like property uh, boundary acts uh, started 1857 in Sweden. It's like a hundred some years after England introduced notions of property Individual property was is a creation, right? Legal creation in 1730s or so from England. Swedes get into it in 1857. There's a lot of regulations on fencing and so on, and you have different actors, especially forest companies that were coming in. And so long story short, a lot of legal, demographic, uh, and sort of external changes that led to forest land uh, as pasture decreasing. And at the same time, because of modern forestry, which again was uh, machine intensive because you basically had a frontier systems, right? So some company or someone has a lot of land and they just need a few machines to do a lot of harvesting fast. So then you have like industrial forestry with monocultural plantations optimized for machines that can operate. And that in turn led to this sort of number of moose <laughs> and, and deer, right? eating the forest buffet is shot up. So if you actually look at this table, this is a really brilliant paper, I must say. Um, you know, so in 1902, the total metric tons of adult livestock grazing in the wild, I mean, the pastures and forests was 112,505. And in, by 2012, the adult game is mostly moose and uh, roe deer. Uh, it's 109,250. I mean, so so the total metric tons hasn't changed. This who has been gracing this change. So what's the way forward? You wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, so I mean, so it's kind of clear, right? Like, well, there's biodiversity, there's gracing. Uh, of course, there's cultural heritage. So Gyudrin and Eva's farm, it's cultural heritage, but even like social transmission of grazing behavior of the entire herd, right? The herd remembers from its mother and the mother remembers mother's mother and father and so on. So there's this massive thing that comes with the herd as well. And of course, you need to know how to do this sort of type of grazing. So that's a huge component. Same with Sven Alf and two other farmers who do natural grazing. We And then of course we have food, that's what we're producing. So how do we actually put all of this together? Um, the main constraints and challenges are, okay, so at sort of the basic, level you have landscape structure and transport logistics but in this case we sort of solve it because elizabeth has to come here three days a week so she's here monday morning at 11. Yeah. so anyway so so that means we can deliver meat in, in freezer packs 
right? But prices and subsidies are a huge issue. So if you look at the current supply chains, there is a lot of obfuscation of who actually makes the money exactly where. So we also want this thing to be completely transparent. Of course, we need consumers willing to buy and committing to buying, right? Because you are bringing, you know, cold chain and there's a lot of regulations that we have to abide by. Otherwise, we get into trouble with authorities. So then we need committed customers who actually commit to buying things. So that's extremely important. Um, yeah, so I would say the main problem here is simply the you know, uh, you know, getting a market firmly fixed and then satisfying the requirements for the cold chain, right, for the health authorities. That's, we haven't solved that yet because this is basically the pitch. Let's see if we can sell 10 kilos of meat a week on average, then we can actually expect it, right? And uh, this is the main hindrance why farmers don't sell direct to consumers because basically all the farmers we have ever talked to say, yes, I would love to sell my, my things directly to the local customer base, but I have a full-time job being a producer. I don't have time to do marketing and distribution and all the laws and re regulations and all of this. I can't fulfill all of yeah. this on my farm. I have to sell my milk to Ola or my meat to the, yeah. to the, to the butchers because they're, they feel like they're a little bit trapped in this large-scale yeah. system, especially the small-scale producers. Uh, because the system is generally designed for the large scale uh, producers as well. Exactly, the regulations. So, yeah. So our immediate plans are to apply for research grants to allow long term natural experiments. Um, so we have started with piloting this year, looking at what is what are the sort of the what's the point of departure, what are the preconditions there? And we are hoping to be able to start up uh, actual research projects by next year. And you are spending three months this winter in building the Indian side of the operation. Um, and we have a number of uh, trial fields that we have set up this summer that we want to do experiments on next summer. And there are plenty of extra or master's thesis or whatever undergrad thesis opportunities, both in the Indian and the Swedish field stations. Tons of stuff. Yes. And the way we are doing this now is that we are basically bootstrapping this. We're using revenues from AI and digital consulting that feeds back into developing the other aspects of the, of the family company. And a very important part, as you've been mentioning too, is to have a very transparent cost model and profit that we make, at least now to start with, goes back completely into research and development and building infrastructure. Where it will be eater funded R&D, right? So the eaters can have a say in what we are going to do, our plans and sort of have a, yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit our ultimate goal is also to get everybody eats and to get people invested in what they are eating and how that food comes about and maybe even so invested that they want to have a say in the development of these farms and what these these farms management practices and uh, research in in making those practices more aligned with the exactly uh, future so our, our, our potential customers which are basically students and researchers will have a default um access to yeah our research newsletter and will be invited to quarterly meetings and stuff like this. You don't have to go. So, okay, natural experiments. Quite briefly about our natural experience. So this is where we are. So we've been mentioning these neighboring farms. So we are here. The bee farmer is just here in the neighborhood and then here's the forest grazing house. So that's 10 kilometers into the forest and their forest they're foraging on uh, land owned by SEA and they got an exemption actually so that they are allowed to, to do that because legally usually you are not allowed because to. Because they have continuously maintained yeah. their hoofen uh, by Yeah, so it, it, it was a bit of a loophole in the law that if you had continuously used forest grazing, then you could get an exemption when this was so, outlawed in so the So SEA's the ancestors, predecessors, yes. legal team simply could not get rid of this uh, farm. Right? Yeah. The operations yes. that were done in the yes. 50s. Um, and we mentioned before that things take time. So if you look at our particular farm that we sort of happened to buy, uh, there is a forest patch of six hectares that this photo is about 10 years old. It was clear cut 15 years ago. So this is the clear cut. 
There's some old grazing fields that are still intact here. If you go back to the 60s, you see that then you had uh, the forest that was then later clear cut. So here it was in the process of becoming a mature uh, forest. Yeah, and we in the in the videos you will see. So this is basically where the barn house is. This is field one. This is field two, two. Roman two. This is field three, and this is the neighboring field of Sven Alfs, where we're doing controls, where he's taking hay without animals on it. And then uh, in the immediate future, this will be field four, where we want to introduce Gudrun and Eva's uh, mountain cows, special breed of Swedish yeah, mountain cool. cows, Felku, in the back, where the forests are regenerated. Yes, so we have introduced grazing now this season after about 40 years of no grazing on the land. So we're doing it in different ways in these different plots. Um, yes, so I mentioned the forest grazing dairy herd. Um, so they have around 70 animals in total, so including uh, calves and youngsters. And they, grass, they graze in the forest for three months per year, come back to the barn every, every night. And this year we just put GPS loggers on some of the of the cows, the mainly the matriarchs who are leading the 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 part sub parts of the of the herd. And this just gives you an impression of how different it it varies. So they really vary uh, from day to day how far they go, you know, depending on the weather and all sorts of different conditions, and to what extent they stay gathered or they spread out more and so on. So this would be very fascinating to find out more about this. And they also have three different breeds of cows on this farm. They have Fjellpo, which is a traditional breed. And then they have Esserbia, which is one of the popular milk breeds in Sweden, and then Jersey, which is one of the less common ones. And they see a bit differences also in the behavior of these cows. And you might expect that the traditional breed is better at finding scarce resources, uh, for example. Um, so some possibilities for, for study here, if you look at what has been done in the, in the literature, possibilities are basically endless. So a recent study that pointed out that ecology and agronomy research often study the same thing completely separately, and they, they often forget to talk to each other because they're actually studying similar questions, but they're in different disciplines. And this is in general a problem, right? Because Agricultural research by its very nature is multidisciplinary and you need collaboration between different fields. Um, so they were pointing out how you really, we really need more field experiments that manipulate plant species diversity in grazed systems to see the effects yeah. that this has. So that's a great example of a production centered R&D. Yeah. Um, and from the same study, why why would it be important then to have a high diversity uh, in a grazing land? Well, there are a lot of potential uh, benefits. Um, so you might have higher, you know, the more species, the more resilience to extreme events, uh, the more resilience to different diseases. Uh, and you actually see in general a higher root biomass in more diverse pastures. Uh, and this can also lead to higher soil carbon uh, and nitrogen, uh, sorry, carbon storage, nitrogen uh, production, and a higher water potential binding capacity in the soil. Um, so, of course, I mean, we are definitely looking for someone with skills neither of us have and will take a long time to acquire, especially 400x microscopy, subterranean microscopy. So if anyone is into fungal taxonomy, bacterial taxonomy, uh, you know various uh, you know various levels of invertebrates and uh, animal fauna population in the soils, it would be great uh, if you're interested for X job. We might be even able to feed you like some meat every day. We can feed you we'll, Rosa. We can figure out something. <laughs> the matriarch from because this year, Rosa. It's, we it's can feed her. That's screaming out loud we want to do yeah. this in the forests we know where the cows are going and actually do soil measurements and so on so that would be very nice you wanted to say some final words about yeah, this so case study a, before uh, one minute so basically we 
we started out our, our plan actually way more ambitiously and then this got defeated by like energy, you know, and time. So our sort of longer term plan is to actually slowly renovate these buildings because we it's basically abandoned buildings that we have, renovate them so that we could actually have some kind of a springboard model for aspiring young people who want to farm in Sweden. Um, so we're trying to make some pathways through the Erasmus program as a as a, a living lab coursework. But the main idea is this: you know, you you come with very little budget that you bring, you know, to the party. You can you can lease like a couple of hectares or whatever for several years, and then you actually do an enterprise, right? You bootstrap up an enterprise, and we have schemas, schematics. We are part of various networks like this Ridgedale, Ridgedale Farm. And one particular thing is, you know, without buying big tractors for two million and getting in debt forever, you can just build simple things like this. The entire blueprint is available. We will provide all the tools. There are some neighboring couple that are building a winter workshop to build these things. So you can have a broiler chicken, a pasture raised broiler chicken operation where you can turn a net profit of 52,000 euro, like, like half a million sec, right? on um, 2.5 hectares by putting 948 hours of labor, right? And there's a little bit of a catch here. The real catch is that you need to invest in a slaughter facility for about 150,000 sec. And that's, and then the, the innovation was already done by Richard Perkins because he conformed to Swedish regulations. He's a Brit stuck with the Swedish, I mean, married to a Swede here. So yeah, so he has done all the blueprints and everything so you can actually just implement it, right? And that means you can slaughter the chicken legally and then you can sell. Right? So this is an example. We don't have the gas for it. I'm more interested in nuts. But uh, if somebody is enthusiastic and they want to do it, we want to be able to set up these springboards, right? Because in, in a couple of years, you can learn, earn enough to buy some of the lands. And of course, the average age of a Swedish farmer is really high. It's higher than the US, right? So all these, you know, these mountain dwellings, there are people that own them are demented. I mean, they, they live in their homes demented. They're in their 80s, 90s. Yeah. A so lot of none of their children or grandchildren want to take over, right? So this is a real problem, right? And of course, you know, you can do IT consulting from anywhere in the world and so on. So you can couple the two. And that's sort of my living example here, right? So anyway, I'm done with my blabbering. We can open for questions. There is a survey in Mentimeter. I don't know if you have time for it. Yeah. So if people maybe want to go here, that would be really great. Um, okay, so. um, there you go. Uh, I mean, this is just whether our slogan makes sense, <laughs> right? Okay. Everybody likes radical transparency. Yeah, this grams. is the. Yeah, I put it in grams. Like, Oish. I mean, come on, <laughs> thousand grams is a kilogram, but okay. In India, grams are a lot <laughs> for meats, right? It's uh, most people eat very little meats per year. Right, and what I mean is if you if you organize, you live in a dormitory or in a house with a bunch of people, it's much more economical to get larger volumes, right? Uh, so you can. Let's see, so. You didn't put zero there. Well, yeah. Quite a 
dashes for you. Assuming so this is the, the real question, right? So a lot of the logistics is your freezer capacity. <laughs> so we just ordered our 900 liter freezer with my entire AI consulting last month <laughs> and a refrigerator of 300 liters. So we're still, I mean, if you have some rough idea of how much could be expected to be delivered every week, say to Uppsala and I have some colleagues and particle physicists and Angstrom and mathematicians who also want to buy stuff. So then we can basically see if we can get away with one freezer and then go to the municipality with our full business plan because it's a case by case basis. The, the numbers are so small, right? That's why the data would help. Right, this is the other thing, right? So we are also very curious if you or if someone you know may be interested in doing an undergraduate or, or master's thesis work, especially in the summertime. Uh, and if there is interest, then we could try to provide some, you know, for Swedes, we could provide some basic accommodation. But I think for EU students, there was per DMs you get from this program um, called Enlight. So there is a header board, you can stay a bit more fancy or just rough it like us and, and provide separate toilet and stuff like that. So yes, taxonomy is the big skill that we would like here. Right. And then the next main thing is uh, this one. So how to stay connected if you, if you are code this, it just takes you to a, a Google sheet. And then there you can fill details on your email and so on. So that, uh, yeah, we can basically try to operationalize this. And today, yes, so we have exactly 43 days before we can figure out <laughs> whether we can get the approval, right? So yeah, before, before the municipality closes for Christmas, it's November. I mean, what, what, what I'm saying is that even if you say you would like to buy this meat, we can't just provide you the meat. We have to go through an entire legal process first, right? And that can take some time. Shortly put, we are in the yeah. in the phase of organizing this and yeah. setting it up, and it would become realized towards next spring. Yeah. Uh, yeah, otherwise we're not going to even plug in the freezer. It's going to save a lot. So thank you for your time. <laughs> So I'll uh, just open the floor for questions. How, how much uh, how much time do you have for that? Uh, we have time, so okay. it's more if you have constraints and need to run. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I think you. Yes. Uh, but I was. Just a bit curious on the title, the title of the team. Sort of why did you put that title and what do you mean by climate positive? Sort of why, why did you choose that as sort of a, I don't know, angle for attacking this? That's, <laughs> That's uh, yeah. Like this, yeah. you would you see more about sort of diversity, popularity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's a very good question. And, um, we chose the title Climate Positive Beef uh, partly to, because it's a provocative title, title that draws interest and it ties into what we want to do. We want to uh, address all of these values that is climate change, biodiversity preservation, uh, animal ethics, etc., human nourishment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we do want to take a broader issue and not only focus on climate change. So we put it in the title as a bit of a of a teaser, and we could have actually put a bit more focus on it here because we are sort of one of our main goals is to, if you look at the, the meat guide that WWF has provided, they have these guides, right, for fish and for vegetables and for meat, and they make happy and sad smileys. And what you see for meat is that even krav, so the organic and the Swedish svenskjil naturbeter kött, uh, they perform very well on all the other uh, key values, biodiversity, etc. Uh, but they still get an unhappy smiley for the climate impact, right? Uh, and it's very much the perception also in general 
uh, in the general population that it is impossible to make beef in a way that would have a neutral or even positive climate impact. And that is what we want to challenge. We think that it is fully possible with research and development to get to a point where you can do climate neutral or climate positive beef and dairy products. And that a key in getting there is to connect back to these traditional methods of rearing animals. And yes, it would mean trade-offs. We would need to produce less than we do now. Uh, but with these types of traditional rearing methods that are about to get lost, I think we can get there, but we need more research to see, is it really, you know, these promises of increased carbon storage in the ground, is it really coming through? Is it actually working in practice in Swedish conditions, uh, in Northern Sweden, not just in Southern Sweden, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also new, uh, new technologies that we didn't talk about today, like how can you reduce methane emission for cows, for example, though that's an experimental development from many different angles now. Um, so I would say that it is possible to get there and it's one of our core uh, missions that fits into the bigger picture because also we cannot only fight climate change. If we focus on only fighting climate change, and we don't focus at all on biodiversity, on, uh, on other uh, goals, everything is lost anyway, right? So <laughs> if ecosystems collapse, we all die. But if it gets too hot, we all die, so. Anyway, I'm not able to find the, but it's a WWF meat guide. Uh, oh, it's in the, I think they have it only in the Swedish. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fine, yeah. you can Google it, but. Shot the, guide then. Yeah, but the other main point is that, uh, I mean, the reason I put this, this up is it's a interdependent, it's a wicked problem, right? Climate is not inseparable from biodiversity, and that's exactly what the flowchart tries to tries to say. So and in the beginning? Yeah. The very beginning? The second mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm. Yes. That was a long answer to your question. Yeah, that's another good question, because we had the word affordable in the title, didn't we? Uh, and we didn't talk a lot about that now. It was kind of, it was a bit implicit in what we were talking about, but we didn't say it straight out. So part of having this transparent cost model and shortening the value chain and selling direct from farmer to consumer is that when you cut out the middlemen, you cut out a lot of the pieces of the pie that of that takes the money that you pay as a consumer right so the preliminary from from our interactions with the local farmers and knowing uh, their cost models uh, it looks completely reasonable to sell at equivalent prices that ICA or Coop would charge for conventionally produced beef for this type of natural sem uh, beef that grazes on semi-natural grazeland or forest grazing um, so it seems perfectly doable to end up in a similar cost to like the kilogram prices somewhere between 180 and 200, yeah. depending on the farmer. Yeah. And the butcher basically charges like 35 sec per kilo for butchering and vacuum packing and dating and everything. So, well, whatever, uh, say we do 190 sec, uh, whatever the butcher takes, the butcher takes, and then the remaining basically goes to the farmer and everything else. So what we are thinking is basically, if you just deliver the SLU, it's part of her exact, I mean, existing transportation logistics. So then it's just to freeze the material and do some, some paperwork. And all of that time would be basically uh, what we call this extra money for the mediator, which would be our bake works. And all of that we, we can commit to reinvesting in infrastructure because the real challenge is we have to connect these fields, these different pastures, span all paths. We next year we would like to, for example, have corridors, electric corridors, so the cows can actually move from pasture to pasture. Right now, we they bring these big trucks, load the cows up. It's very labor and fossil fuel intensive, right? So, so we want to do these kinds of things and beyond bootstrapping from our AI arm, it'll be great if we can actually you know, recycle the money from the eaters back into these projects. 
Um, Any more final questions? I was wondering how you define local, since you're talking about producing and consuming locally, but then you just said uh, you're already coming here to sell that. I mean, the local is mathematical, so the optimization problem is using existing pathways, right? So because she has to come here for work, it becomes transportationally local. But we are also in, in, the, in talks with the, the restaurants in the village where I can deliver with the backpack, right? So that's actually physically local. So shortly put, not just physically local, but local in the terms of no added transportation on top of what is already happening. So that it's direct, a direct connection between farmer and consumer in a way that doesn't add any carbon footprint in the transport. Saga's question. Mm -hmm. Sense, uh, mm -hmm. but also like I think the name, uh, since we talk a lot about the benefit of the inside, wouldn't perhaps like simply name like green light or something? Green light, yeah, that is like the goal system yeah. that has yeah. green light. Yeah, um, yeah. no, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, both of them. Um, now with the climate positive, um, but by the first, is that included in the climate? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. yeah, biodiversity, carbon turnover, uh, nitrogen flow controls, they're all part of it, uh, pollinator health. Uh, so in fact, our sort of, we haven't talked about this with to each other yet. We also are trying to bring in a honey farm. So in fact, mathematically speaking, you need milk, meat, and honey. And when you have all those three co-produced, you have a natural traditional ecosystem base. So we haven't met the, the honey farmers there in, an, in another hill. So eventually we would definitely want to also bring in honey. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, Sarah. Before we wrap this up. How many cows do you have at your, uh, your home farm? Yeah, so this year we had cows in collaboration with the neighbor Sven Alf. So eight of his uh, cows, a matriarch and seven heifers, were grazing on our lands. So we spent a nice vacation putting, putting up electric fencing and then traying out these different... But they're uh, back in the barn products. for the winter. Yeah, they moved back just, just a week ago or so. Yeah, they were out until last weekend, right? And then they moved yeah, back yeah. Uh, to... And they're still, they're outdoors until the snow comes and the snow came this Wednesday. So now they're moving indoors yeah. for the winter. I'm also trying to fix uh, water for winter water without putting in a mechanical part. So we try purely gravity fed, spring fed well from like a hundred years ago. So I'm trying to work out like, we've just put an electric cable. So, you know, it's not going to freeze and then it'll be cow pumped thing. So we're going to experiment this winter. So next winter we can actually have cow pumped gravity fed water solution, right? So these are things to, to figure in so that you don't get like a big machine that breaks down and then you have to take a loan from the bank. But Svenolf has 70 cows, another neighboring farmer has 300, Gudrun and Eva have 70, and then one more farmer who's interested in joining us, but we haven't thoroughly vetted them. They have about 150 beef cows, yeah. so it's a lot. Your operation is gonna be uh, facilitating pasture land and uh, in the summertime that they will be uh, indoor rearing. Yeah. yeah, and the but the beef, yeah, actually I said that they're moving indoors, but they actually do, they have outdoor access and they do yeah. go out every day, the, the beef cows in winter. Um, but obviously they can't eat through the snow because this far north, they, they're lucky enough to still have pretty much continuous snow cover. It's not the, the muddiness down that we getting used to down here. Yeah. Uh, the dairy cows are indoors over winter, so they do the traditional style rearing. And, and, all summer, their, too. Yeah. and summer too, they come home. They night. come home yeah. overnight, yeah, so they're indoors overnight. And there are two, two full days and nights of what happens in Gudrun and Eva's cow in the playlist. You can just go all out and understand how to clean the shit and everything. So, All right, I think we should wrap it up. Uh, let's uh, Thank you very much for... Yeah. Uh,
coming and listening yes. to us this hour. Uh, I would like to say thank you to you. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, yeah. thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we should give them a, a, an applause. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have questions you want to discuss a little bit more, please uh, hang around. This is all good. But uh, for now, uh,